going to jam stuff into their uh, yeah. their little wizards. We're going to cancel. That's what happened. And I said, oh, what's the plan? Where did she fly? Um, 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 the United American or American United Airlines. Yeah, my flight was still okay. Yeah. 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 I never did the well here yeah. I told the little boy to go for it and go for But I like to come back and try because I got the two days. She's doing good. I think she's Good morning, whatever it is. <laughs> it's good to have Cinda on Zoom and Linda Clutter. Uh, so if we will go ahead and begin. Welcome to Human Relations Sunday. So some of you, you're going, what is that? Well, you will know before the service is over. Everyone loves a hero because in the face of injustice, a hero stands up. For the frustrated and voiceless, a hero speaks up. When God's children were oppressed, a hero set the captives free. And now through your connection with the United Methodist Church, you can follow his example. You can be a hero too. Your generous gift to the Human Relations Day special offering empowers a host of humble heroes who believe everyone has the right to realize their potential as human beings in relationship with one another. Through this special offering of the United Methodist Church, generally celebrated in January and the Sunday before the national observance of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, you offer a lasting solution. You bring permanent justice through systemic change and community development. You bring wholeness and economic opportunity to strengthen those who have no hope. The majority of this special offering benefits neighborhood ministries through community developers empowering those closest to the need to do the most good. A significant portion supports community advocacy through United Methodist Voluntary Services, raising awareness of problems like poverty and homelessness, human trafficking, immigration, and environmental justice. Your giving gives hope to at-risk teens through ministries like the Youth Offender Rehabilitation Program, positioning young men and women for success as they find their way forward once again. When you give to the Human Relations Day offering, you become a humble hero, affirming that every one of God's children deserves justice, equality, and the opportunity to walk freely in the light of God's love. And you empower each of them to someday become heroes too. Together, we do more. Learn more about Human Relations Day. Visit www.umcgiving.org forward slash HRD. Ministry goes beyond Sunday morning worship and the walls of the church. Tending to the needs of the total person is at the heart of mission work. And no one understands that better than the United Methodist Church. All over the world, dedicated people are doing social justice work at the grassroots level. One ministry in San Juan, Puerto Rico works with women who are victims of domestic violence. Another on the Texas and Mexico border works with teenagers to steer them from a life of crime and drugs. The Amachi program in Denver is helping to instill a sense of value and worth with children who are growing up without their parents because of incarceration. These are the types of ministries that Human Relations Day focuses on. And these are the types of ministries your gifts support. Connecting with the human spirit is a critical step in making disciples of Jesus Christ. Sometimes people need to see what you will do 
before hearing about what Christ can do. So um, it's interesting because many people ask me, oh good, um, we have more people who join. There's many people who ask me why United Methodism? And this is one of the reasons for United Methodism. It's the connection to do work all over the world. It's great to see that Denver is actually, was actually a focal point of one of those videos. Um, United Methodism is connected. So while we may think we're by ourselves and we are totally on our own, um, it ends up being that we're not. We're actually connecting. And some of those things that you saw, I'm sorry, I'm gonna take this off for the folks that are on the screen um, and you guys. Um, and so consequently, a lot of those things you saw, and believe it or not, human trafficking is occurring in our area. It really is. Um, but all of those things that were listed, we deal with in our area. And we, you know, in programs that, um, they don't come in and start programs. It's up to the community to decide what programs they're going to, uh, to try to do, to build, to address that. But these funds from Human Relations Day are funds that can be drawn from to help. Um, so you're not doing it all on your own. <clears throat> and to me, that's what makes United Methodism a beautiful denomination and the fact that we all work together. We're not by ourselves. I know sometimes we think the conference just makes its decisions and then we just have to abide by them. But the actual truth of the matter is that we can be involved as much as we choose to be. So if we choose not to go to annual conference, and we choose not to participate in district and annual uh, conference stuff. That's our choice. And we're pulling ourselves out of decisions to be made. Um, I'm taking the polity class just as a refresher. And I thank Charlene for um, suggesting that to many of you. And I'm sorry you guys didn't do it this time, but hopefully, you'll decide to take some of those lay courses online. And those of you that don't have online access, I'll be more than happy to come to your house and we, uh, for us to figure out a way that you can. You could come here and, and join, uh, do, use our computers and our online stuff so that you can participate. Because there's people, not just in our area, but all over that are part of this class. And one of the things that we talked about yesterday and uh, is the fact that when it comes to annual conference, it's really hard in rural areas to get anyone to participate unless those are really sold, you know, sold into. And for the longest time, it was because you had to travel too far. Well, that's not the case anymore. We can do it online. So you don't, I mean, all you have to do if you don't have internet at your home is travel to your church, you know? But for every clergy, whether they're a retired or active, there should be an, uh, a lay person. So Jean made this statement yesterday, and I thought, wow, I need to share that with my congregation. If you want to outvote the clergy on stuff, sign up to be a delegate, because that's where you have the ability to do that. If you're unsure of what's going on with the United Methodist Church right now, and you, you think it's just done deal, sign up to be a delegate because your vote counts. And for every laity that will sign up to do that, that counteracts if you think the clergy are voting one way and you want to vote another way. But that's how the Methodist church works. It's not all up or up, even though people sometimes think that's it. It's meant to be both clergy and laity working together to make decisions. <clears throat> and human relations is one of them. I think all of us would agree that we have a lot of work to do in human relations. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the injustice we see every day. And so, God bless you. 
And so they need, they need us to be the hands and feet in, uh, in center. You know, the conference doesn't need to be the hands and feet in center. It needs to be us. And so many of the programs we already have and some of the programs that we could be involved with or could help um, is one of those. And I will just share with you the lead program that I've told you about that's going through the, the sheriffs. If you recognize, that's one of the, the things that they're looking to do is to take young offenders and help change their direction. And so by having the area open uh, for the church from two to five, that is, and we may change those hours since I'm not sure whether DJs is gonna open up or not, or whether there'll be another coffee shop that comes in or whatever, but it's not just meant to say, oh, well, the church is open at that time. Sure, you can come in and use the facility, but it's also to let the community know that the church is open at that time. And, and it's open so that their counselors and the ones involved in this, these programs have a safe, warm place to come and talk. And, and it's so, as you saw in this uh, clip, it's so they can see what God can do before they can listen to what God can do. And I know a lot of folks think, well, it all has to be through, um, it all has to be uh, church oriented. Folks, Jesus didn't work that way. If you look at his life and what he did, he ate with, with tax collectors and sinners, remember? He didn't go looking just for a church or a synagogue. He went wherever the people were, and that is our job, our duty. All right. <clears throat> we have some birthdays. Dawson uh, Crawford's birthday is today. I'm oh, sorry, not today. On the 19th. Linda Wilson's birthday is on the 21st. So I think it's time that we sing happy birthday to her. Would you all like to do that? Yeah. All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you and many more. And Linda, we are so blessed that you share your talents with us every Sunday and we, we are just so thankful for you. And then Vicki Meyer's birthday is on the 23rd. And then Brenna Whitmer's birthday is on the 23rd. As I said, the, the coffee shop is open between two and five in the afternoons. Um, and if you feel so led to be part of that, and all you have to do is just be here. You don't have to really make anything or do anything because it's pretty much self-serve and we don't charge like prices. You just ask for donations and that's it. But if you would like to help in that endeavor, I would deeply appreciate it because last week I ended up not being able to open hardly at all because I had things I had to do and run and do. So, um, I mean, it's not a lot to ask of someone to just walk in and, and uh, serve, but uh, <laughs> you know, if that's, you know, let pray about it and let the Lord kind of guide it. And the fitness room is open, so we need to let our neighbors know that 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 is another option since it's cold and messy. Um, we want people to be safe and we also want them to be healthy. Uh, yoga is on Friday at 9.30, so we're back and up and running. And then Coffee with the Chief is on Saturday at 9 a.m. So you'll want to come and talk with Dale. Um, I was very blessed to, to have that contact when I was trying to travel home from seeing Vicki Byers the other day. So it, it's, it's great to have friends uh, that you can call on and say, hey, can you give me a heads up as to what's going on while I've been sitting here for, in traffic for two hours? <laughs> anyway, and uh, I, I don't think there's any other announcements, um, but please, please understand that um, we are here to not only worship God, but also to be brothers and sisters in Christ with each other. 
If you are visiting with us, whether it's online or whether you're here, we are so glad you're with us this morning. And Linda is going to play a beautiful prelude, and we are so blessed to hear it. particularly care for this wonderful Charles Wesley hymn, but uh, has a great message for us. And I know it was one of the ones I learned as a child, and it has given me strength through the years. must try our patience. We often doubt. Oh. Lord, how we must try our patience. We often doubt. Oh, Lord, how we must try our patience. We often doubt when we should place our faith in your abiding presence. We think that we have all the answers and judge others who fail to live up to our expectations. We think that we are the one that matters in the cross. We place ourselves in the center of our own universe. Forgive us when we show how shallow our faith is. Help us to raise the understanding in which you have already worked in our lives and will continue to work as we journey in faith. Bring love, to light and joy, and let it flood through our whole beings that we may be transformed into people of joyful service and faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please listen to these words of assurance. God's love is continually poured out for us. 
Drink from the cup of forgiveness and compassion, dear ones. In Jesus' name, you are forgiven. Amen. You may be seated. We come to a time of prayer, and I will tell you, I did see Vicki, and um, she looks much better than when I saw her before, uh, and I'm just claiming uh, God's grace and healing power on her life. Just as before, I told you that it's a long road for her. So I would encourage you to reach out to her, either by phone or by card. But when you do, do it with an attitude of encouragement. To let her know we are continually praying for her, um, that we don't think she's a lost cause. Because <laughs> I think people that have been sick for a long time how you feel like maybe they are a lost cause and they aren't um there are decisions that have to be made uh fairly soon which um some people uh might consider it like pressure uh this is the normal stuff that happens anybody who's had a loved one who's been ill for a while knows that you just can't go day by day without having to think a little bit more forward. So we want to send positive thoughts and positive uh, intent and feeling. So to lift her up, especially since it's so, so hard for people to actually go and visit her um, where she is. But she is back at the rehab. Um, and like I said, they have her getting up and, and she's lost weight and it, you know, she's, I'm claiming she's doing well. So I'm not claiming anything other than that. This morning early, we received notification of, uh, of uh, Charlene's neighbor. Uh, I know Charlene is on. I don't know if Charlene would like to share with us more information about that. Maybe not. Okay. So her neighbor has gone through a considerable um, struggles and trials. Um, or her, someone that she's friends with in her area, Diane, and Diane Bowen. And she said that, uh, you know, losing a dog and then um, she lost her husband two weeks ago or short, a little while ago. Um, and then also now the dog that she adopted had been attacked. And so when those things happen, my mother always said they happen in threes. I don't know whether that's true or not, but it does seem, it does seem uh, insurmountable. So we do want to lift Diana. Okay, Charlene, do you want to share any more or did I get it right? Because I kind of just glanced at the text. That's, that's exactly right. She had just, she had just had to have the old one put down. Then she, then her husband, She's been struggling with him and Alzheimer's and visiting him every day. And then he passed. And now this, she had just gotten this dog and really they were bonding so well and it got viciously attacked and there was nothing they could do. And she's devastated. <laughs> yeah. And so we want to keep her in our prayers. I know that um, Noah had a wonderful little birthday party yesterday, and uh, so thank you for your, your prayers on his birthday. And also, Brianna had, had requested some prayers for a friend as well, and thank you for those that are, are lifting her in prayer as well. Um, it's good to see Miss Mary back uh, from her long travels. She's back home, um, and hopefully... Uh, is getting settled back in. It's good to have uh, Lori back as well. Um, folks have come home and we're glad that they're back. Are there any other prayer requests? All right. Let us go to God in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, Speak to us, for we are sitting and listening for your word of encouragement. We drift off and lose our sight on you. 
But Lord, we pray that you are with us. If you are listening, whether we be in need or whether we are lifting the needs of others, whether we are young or whether we are old, eternal God and lover of our souls, we come to you this morning hungry for something from you that will change the rest of our lives. We come hungering for honesty instead of corruption, for generosity instead of greed. We come hungering for integrity instead of intrigue. We come hungering for our neighbors to be fed and for all to have enough honest work to provide the basic needs of their families. We come this morning hungering for the righteousness to flow like rainwater for justice, like an ever-flowing stream described by the prophets. We come hungry. We come listening for your words, describing how we can participate in your work. And Lord, this special day of Human Relations Day, prick our minds and our hearts with possibilities. And may the funds that are given and raised all over the world for this offering be used for your glory to help the needs of many. We come listening for ways that we can be a part of a solution and not part of the problem. We come listening in fear and trembling and praying that we have the courage to respond and act with a clear word of instruction from you. Speak, Lord, for your children are listening. Lord of hope and light. In the midst of darkness, you offered light to people who lived in fear. Lord, we know there is power in prayer. It is not something that we just say. It is something we do because we love you and know the power that is there. And so it is with that power and that determination and assurance, Lord, that we all come before you to offer prayer for those in need of surgery, those who have health concerns, we lift up our community, Lord, for we know that Omicron is here and we know that it is growing and multiplying. We lift up our first responders, our police, our firefighters, our EMTs, all of those, Lord, nurses, doctors, even teachers who go into harm's way, not for their own sake, but for the sake of others. We lift up our nation and all those that are in authority, whether they be local or state or national. Lord, we pray for wisdom and guidance, for civility and wise choices. We ask that you would keep the welfare of the world in our, our eyesight, in our focus, that we don't make decisions that are only good for just a few, but for all, that we seek as our as John Wesley asked us to do, to do no harm and to do good everywhere, every time, every way we possibly can. And to stay in love with you, Lord, which we can only do when we are spiritually connected with you daily. And so we pray for the fervent prayers and meditation and study of your word be it aroused in every single one of us be with pastors and religious leaders all over the world. Lord, they struggle, and many of my colleagues have decided to take a sabbatical or to retire, and Lord, there's so much work to be done. There's such a need. So you gird us up and strengthen us and give us the wisdom and clarity to do what we know we must do, to speak your words and not our own. We ask that you would be with anyone who is suffering or in any kind of trouble. All of those unspoken requests, and especially those we have looked at this morning, we lift up victims of violence who have no choice, Lord, but to deal with whatever they've been given. Raise up brothers and sisters to walk alongside them and help heal the wounds. Be with those who see violence as their only choice of, of doing anything. Help them understand that that is not the case. 
but violence is only a response to selfish desires, feeling that they're hurt or rejected. And Lord, you don't reject anyone. We ask that you would be with all of those that are struggling from the fires and the aftermath. And now our brothers and sisters in Tonga, Lord, and all in that area that are dealing with <clears throat> the tsunami. Lord, we ask that, that no lives would be lost and that there would be safety for those that need safety. We ask that you would be with Ray and Bobby Abbott, Anne and Christine Aragon, Matthew Blankenship, Lamon Caton, Justin and Katie Clark and Sons, Brianna and Noah Clutter, Linda Clutter, Jackson Collier, Dora May Crawford, Jean Davis, Barbara Donahue, Marilyn Eagles, Mike Gingrich, Bill Hazard, Marvine Lobato, Gordon Lynch, Thelma Martinez and family, Bill McClure, Joanne Milligan, Linda Mix, Vicki and Gerald Myers, Jeannie and Mike Norris, Craig and Roxanne Perrin, Wayne Phillips, Trina Lovato Qualamon, Vicki's friend Carla, Cinda Roberts, Jolene Robinson, Charlene Schaefer, Zach Ziegler, Rick Stewart, Anne Trujillo, Alice Wardlow, Lois Willis, Linda and Dick Wilson, Everett and Sharon Winkles, the newborn boy from Cedar Edge, and Lord, we lift up Diane Bowen this morning, as well as all the others that we have mentioned. We know there are those that are grieving, and we pray for them and lift up the family of Stan Aldrich, Isabel Geigel, Brad Heal, Victoria Hill, Dave Lewis, Cal Massey, Carol Martin, Mary Morfitt, Sawyer Navarro, so, uh, Mary Pacheco, Ray Pacheco, Van Pepper, Greg Peterson, Alice Phillips, Philip Oigers. Lord, we pray that you would be with them and forgive my mispronunciation of any name for each one is so valuable, Lord. Let my mistakes not impede the prayers that are lifted. And as we pray together, as you had instructed the disciples, let the prayer that we raise not just be words we say, but let it speak to our hearts and instruct our way of living daily. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today is from Psalm 18, 2 through 11, verses 16 through 19. The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from mine enemies. The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. 
The earth trembled and quaked, and the foundations of the mountain shook. They trembled because he was angry. Smoke rose from his nostrils. Consuming fire came from his mouth. Burning coals blazed out of it. He parted the heavens and came down. Dark clouds were under his feet. He mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his carina, his cano his something Can't around him, the dark rain clouds of the sky. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted me. Our epistle is 2 Corinthians verse, or chapter 6, verses 2 through 9. Since we work together with him, we all are also begging you not to receive the grace of God in vain. He says, I listened to you at the right time, and I helped you on the day of salvation. Look, now is the right time. Look, now is the day of salvation. We don't give anyone any reason to be offended about anything so that our ministry won't be criticized. Instead, we commend ourselves as ministers of God in every way. We did this with our great endurance through problems, disasters, and stressful situations. We went through beatings, imprisonments, and riots. We experienced hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger. We displayed purity, knowledge, patience, and generosity. We served with the Holy Spirit, genuine love, telling the truth, and God's power. We carried the weapons of righteousness in our right hand and our left hand. We were treated with honor and dishonor and with verbal abuse and good evaluation. We were seen as both fake and real, as unknown and well-known, as dying, and look, we are alive. We are seen as punished, but not killed. The Old Testament is Isaiah 62, verses 1 through 7 and 10 through 12. Jerusalem redeemed. For Zion's sake, I won't keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I won't sit still until her righteousness shines out like a light and her salvation blazes like a torch. Nations will see your righteousness, all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name, which the Lord's own mouth will determine. You will be a splendid garland in the Lord's hand, a royal turban in the palm of God's hand. You will no longer be called abandoned, and your land will no longer be called deserted. Instead, you will be called, my delight is in her and your land married. Because the Lord delights in you, your land will be cared for once again. As a young man marries a young woman, so your sons will marry you. With the joy of a bridegroom because of your bride, so your God will rejoice because of you. Upon your walls, Jerusalem, I have appointed sentinels continually, all day and all night. They won't keep silent. You who call on the Lord, don't rest and don't allow God to rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it the praise of the earth. Pass through, pass through the quails. Prepare the way for the people. Build, build the road, clear away the stones. Raise up a signal for the peoples. This is what the Lord announced to the Lord's distant region. Say to daughter Zion, Look, your deliverer arrives, bringing reward and payment. They will be called the holy people, redeemed by the Lord, and you will, you will be called sought after, a city that is not abandoned. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. So this morning, this may seem and feel a little bit like a, a classroom. And so... Um, I hope it enlightens you. I hope it gives you some hope and, and joy. Um, and But I do understand that it's very different teaching and preaching that I normally have done. So my question to you right now is, do you know who the daughter of Zion is? And all of your studies and all of your, your church going and all of your Sunday school teaching, who is the daughter of Zion? Anyone? Well, good. I have some listening ears this morning because you don't have an answer. And there is an answer. And it is an amazing answer. And I hope this pricks your heart to know that God has been with us is with us and will continue to be with us. 
The daughter of Zion, and it's mentioned that way, is mentioned many times in the Old Testament, usually in prophecy and in poetry. Zion, the hill on which the temple is built, is the Mount of Zion. Did you know that? If I was able to find actual pictures, and I was kind of appalled that we don't have those pictures <clears throat> when you go to search for them. But the temple in Jesus' day was set on a hill. In fact, you had the temple on the hill, and then right next to it, and he made it higher, was Herod's castle, you know, whatever you want to call it. Because that is where Herod, where the king of the Jews, was located. And so what ends up happening when the, the Magi come, of course, it's very usual for the king to be on the highest point for several reasons. Number one, they can see over everything. And number two, they can help protect the city because they can see over everything. Well, there isn't really a good picture, but there is the hill, which, which is called Mount Zion, before Jerusalem ever existed, before any of that stuff was there. That hill on which the temple was built is Zion. Well, that brings us to the daughter of Zion. Are we talking about little hills? What are we talking about there? Well, in 2 Kings, it says, when at the uh, Assyria threatened Jerusalem, King Hezekiah went to the Lord in response, and God sent Isaiah to assure Hezekiah that Jerusalem would not fall to Assyria. God considered the threatening insult to the virgin daughter of Zion. Now, if you've already thought daughter of Zion is a metaphor, I will tell you, yes, it is. But it is also real, a real metaphor. And it goes on through the Old Testament. And remember, Jesus was a good Jew, and he knew all of these scriptures. What was the temple on top of Zion? What did that represent? Well, let's go back in your history a bit. Before the temple was built, how did the Israelites worship? Do you remember when they were traveling through the wilderness? What was brought with them? Anybody online can join too. They traveled with the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. You all remember that? And what was the belief? That God was there. And David had felt that it was not good that God had to keep roaming all over the place. He didn't quite understand God. And we, we know that now. We can look at life examples and stuff, just like we don't understand God either. So the temple was built to be the physical place where God dwells. And of course, Jesus came knowing that that is not true. For he is God himself the daughter of Zion, and we get to see it a little bit here in the scripture. As a young man marries a young woman, so your sons will marry you. With the joy of the bridegroom because of his bride, so your God will rejoice because of you. So the daughter of Zion is the church. Remember we did the baptismal thing last week when we talked about the Catholic Church, which is not the Catholic Church down the street, but the universal church. We 
universal church <coughs> is the daughter of the Zion. The bridegroom is who? Jesus. I don't know about your image, but that changes things for me. Just like uh, when it says, upon your walls, Jerusalem, I have appointed sentinels. Who do you think the sentinels are for the church? The leaders of the church. <laughs> Being either elected or appointed or volunteering as a leader of the church is extremely important because you have a job to do. What does the sentinel do? It looks after the people. It looks after the community. It looks after remaining holy. For after all, if you were a bride in that day, and it gets repeated in the scripture I just said, you had to be a virgin bride. What does virgin mean? Pure, without sin. Do you realize what God is telling the church, not just then, but now? We must be pure. Have we done that? Absolutely not. But we try. Who is the only one that can make us pure? Because we're now not before the cross and the resurrection. We're now after the cross and the resurrection. What do we all admit can purify us? Is Jesus, death, and resurrection, giving us forgiveness of all the sins we have committed, we are committing, and we will commit in the future. And here is part of the difference, and I would go back to the, the epistle reading, but I hope you go back and study the epistle reading, because it tells us that we're not supposed to take that in vain. We're not supposed to say, okay, well, I believe Jesus died for my sins, so that takes care of me. I can just go on and live like I want to. No. Instead, it should mean that you're letting the Lord work in you. Change your heart. Change your attitudes. Change who you are. And I think if we're honest, we'll, we can think back in our life of someone that we knew who was just really raunchy if you wanted to call them anything, but they were raunchy. And then they came to know the Lord, and all of a sudden they became something totally different. Now, if you don't have that in your background history, then maybe you need to talk to a few of us who have had that situation and have seen it for our own selves. But for many of us, it's a very subtle change. And because it's not immediate, we begin to think, well, there's nothing really happening here. George Mueller started uh, in Bristol. He started an uh, orphanage. People told him, his, even his church people said, you're crazy. Why don't you adopt one or two kids and just be done with it? But he felt that God was leading him to do this. And over a period of many years, he became the leading force of, of people coming to him saying, teach me how to pray like this. Teach me how to do things like this. And he says, all you have to do is pray. And that is believing that God hears your prayers and God will meet your needs. And sometimes even your wants, but your needs. And there's several books written about George Mueller, as well as, uh, you know, his own book that he wrote about how this, uh, this orphanage filled with hundreds of kids would come to a breakfast, sitting down all nice and clean and ready for breakfast, and nothing was on the table. Nothing was in the kitchen. There was absolutely nothing. And he would have them pray. Not these big, long prayers, just a very short, very 
meaningful prayer. A few minutes later, there'd be a knock on the door. Here's the baker. Baker says, I don't know what was wrong. I couldn't sleep last night, but I just, I felt like I, had to, I was supposed to make some, some bread. And uh, so I made three, three serving, you know, three, over three batches and whatever. Uh, here, take this so I can have some sleep, pretty much. All right, bread, fresh, warm bread. Awesome. A few minutes later, there's a knock on the door and there's a milkman who's saying, listen, I don't know if you can help me or not, but the wheel of my cart is broken and there's so much milk on the back of the, the cart, there's no way I can fix it with that. Could you, could you use 10 cans of milk? And you remember those cans of milk were about this big. So Mueller calls for some of the older boys and they go out and they bring those cans in and they serve it. And they have more than enough for that breakfast and even some for their noonday tea. The kids learned, just as many people in England learned during one of the roughest times when people were being put in work, um, workhouses, children were being abandoned, um, their sickness cholera was all over the place. In a time when people should probably question whether they should even be together because of disease, God showed his glory. Why? Because we are the daughter of Zion. And just like a bridegroom would not turn his face from his bride, God will not turn his face from his church. But they have to look toward him. It's not a supernatural thing. Now, I'm just going to ask you this. Do you think that bread and that milk would have appeared if they had not prayed for it? And I'm going to tell you no. This whole faith thing is a participatory event. And those at home, I hope you don't take this in a, in a wrong way, but doing things remotely and not being plugged in and involved in a community of believers is not a full faith experience. You're not growing that way. And we are wired, we have to see things. When we see someone who is sick, who then gets well, and we've been praying over that person and praying for that person, we rejoice in that. And I'm sure Charlene could share some testimonies in her life of how that happened. Why do we forget that? Let me, let me bring you to the scripture. Y'all remember when Jesus came into Jerusalem and people were putting the palms down and Oh, yay, our Savior, Messiah, Hosanna. And during all of that, he stops and he weeps. Now, here's my queer theology coming in. You remember I told you queer theology is not LGBT theology. It just means that I see things in a different perspective sometimes. Most scholars will tell you that passage means he's crying because the walls of the temple are going to crumble down. And that coincides with the fact that he's going to be crucified and then raised up. I really think that what has happened is Jesus knows he's coming to ride the temple. What everybody in that area recognized is that house of God. And there was sin, corruption, even people plotting against him who still couldn't see what God was doing for them. And his tears of weeping are for his bride. For she was not pure. She had lost the shininess. And all the church needed to do at that time 
just as when Christ died and just today, is for the church to earnestly pray for deliverance. And he knew that wasn't going to happen. If you look at those tears during that passion week of everything that happens, it changes where we are, doesn't it? For you see, we are the daughter of Zion. Are we able to present ourselves before our bridegroom, Christ, pure and stainless? We'd like to say we can, but do we honestly, truly believe? And I'm afraid most of us would have to say no. For when hard times and hard things happen, we throw our arms up and we say, well, we can pray. Guys, we need to be more like the faith that George Mueller showed. That needs to be the first thing we do is pray so that we are the pristine <coughs> image of the daughter of Zion. <clears throat> do you think the corruption throughout the churches around the world would be there if everyone that was the, the sentinels, the leaders, were looking to for the church to remain pristine, to remain sinless, to remain believers and firmly bound to the Lord? I don't think you would have any of those issues happening. We as the church, we as the daughter of Zion, have a responsibility for this. So this morning, as we begin to move toward our time of commitment, we need to remember that we serve God in many ways. But if, if it is not participatory with our lives and our talents and our gifts, we're just saying words. I shared this with uh, Lori yesterday. There's a book I recently read. I wouldn't recommend it to everyone because it might, you might think it's crazy, but it's scientific imperial data about how spiritual things work. And the interesting thing that I found, one of the many interesting things is when they were following people who were dying, they followed a group of atheists, they followed a group of, of uh, Christians who were very, not just Christians, but others that were firm in whatever faith, but they participated, they were coming to church, they were having Bible study, they were doing all these things. And then there was this group of people who said they were, but they really, you know, the last time they've been to church may have been like four years ago or whatever, uh, didn't want to do Bible study or pray maybe with the Lord's Prayer occasionally, that kind of thing. When it came to their last hours of life, their last few days of life, the group that had the less stress and anxiety were the believers who had participated in firm, faithful people in the Lord. Many of them passed through that veil with expectancy. The atheists, and this is what threw me, the atheists were the next that had the next lowest anxiety because they had thrown away their belief in God totally. But it was not as low and as well received as the Christians who participated. The group that had the highest anxiety and dreaded and screamed and cried and feared death was the middle group who professed to be faithful followers of the faith but never practiced it. Does that tell you something? It told me a lot. If we only say with our mouth that we are a daughter of Zion, but we never act like it, who are we fooling? God formed us. 
We celebrated that last week. We can't lie to God. You might be able to lie to the IRS or your friend or a neighbor, but you cannot lie to God. He knows. He knows your inner beings, your inner thoughts. So during this time of commitment, I want you to examine your heart and pray that God will reveal not only his truths to you, but also how you can commit your life to him. Let us look at the invitation to offering. Today, we celebrate Human Relations Sunday. Across the United Methodist Connection, we come together to help bridge the gap between church and community by participating in an offering set aside for Human Relations Day. More than half a century, United Methodists have observed this church-wide special Sunday in recognition of the message Jesus demonstrated during his life. All of God's children are important. One of the wonderful aspects of the United Methodist Church is that we can do so much more together than we can do on our own. On Human Relations Day, we join with other United Methodist congregations in this special offering to support neighborhood ministries through community developers, community advocacy through the United Methodist Voluntary Services, and to work at, with at-risk youth through the Youth Offenders Rehabilitation Programs. In recognizing Human Relations Day, we are called to make an impact in the communities where people struggle because they don't have the tools or the resources to reach their God-given potential. Our gifts are part of the building, uh, building beloved communities through faith-based volunteer programs, community developers, and programs that work with at-risk teams. So this morning, let God speak to your heart and I would ask that if you do give an offering to human relations, please mark it for that so that Sue will know um, that it's going for that. Let us give our gifts to the Lord.
can be his servant. continually walk and work with you, relieving your burdens and giving you strength. Go in God's world rejoicing. Amen. As a fire is meant for burning. Okay, and evidently she didn't put that one in. All right, I'll have to play that. That is 2237. And we're just going to do one verse. I'm going to have to use book because I can't flip the thing. And